um, although not a lot of data. So I'm going to go basically through uh, four topics fairly quickly, a little bit of a, an update. I'm Alex, by the way. Um, so the four topics, Qual uh, Qualcomm Tricorder Enterprise Updates, um, Aterico Health, which is a company I've just uh, launched, uh, Health Technology Forum uh, Toronto Chapter, that's uh, coming up soon, and the oblig obligatory clinical and stuff stuff. Actually, I'll put this thing over here. Alex, I want to take a step. Much sure. That way. Mind away? Yeah. You can move the arm. The other two computers, if you want. <coughs> we should be. We should be okay. Um, so there's a, there's a number of you heard me talk about quantified um, uh, tricorder X Prize in the past. So just kind of a, a brief update. I'm not going to go through this again for people who haven't seen it. Um, you can talk to me or you can go on the website take a look at it. That's a very uh, very brief summary of what the uh, what that's trying to achieve. Um, as everybody an update, know, uh, everybody knows about the X Prize. Give a brief overview on it. So just basically, it's a it's a competition um, run by uh, X Prize Foundation uh, from California. Uh, it's a global competition to uh, basically deliver to, uh, basically a light, integrated, user friendly medical. Um, Diagnosis and vital sign measurement tool for direct consumer use. And there's a, a whole lot of attributes around that. You need to measure 13 core conditions, five vital signs, 12 electives, out of, well, three out of 12 electives. Um, and then there's a, a, number of, uh, a number of other attributes around that. But just for the sake of time, I'll move on. So the, the conditions, um, there was a draft guidelines that were released about a year, almost exactly a year ago, I guess. Um, and then the final uh, guidelines were released just in December. So they're actually a little bit late on that. So in, um, in red is uh, I'm showing what changed from the draft guidelines to the final guidelines. So if you're designing, particularly in the elective side of it, if you're designing for the draft guidelines, you would have been very disappointed <laughs> because they changed a fair bit. Um, but on the, on the core conditions, they didn't change too much. So um, there's a couple of interesting ones that uh, came up. Um, uh, stroke um, is a good one. So consider a consumer use case of uh, detecting stroke. Obviously very useful, but how do you uh, run a competition around that? Um, so that, that's, a, that's a good one. In fact, they, they have figured out how to run it, and it's not, it, it makes sense. But uh, when you first see that in, the, uh, in those guidelines, you're saying, okay. Um, uh, T, uh, TB is a good one, too. It requires uh, a higher level of uh, isolation than pretty much every other condition on there. Um, so that was a good one. And then some of the other ones are obviously uh, quite important. So that's the set of conditions. So basically, to, for the um, for the contest, you have to do all for the final uh, final stages. You need to do the entire uh, core set. Uh, so it's um, it's basically twelve plus none of the above. Uh, five vital signs measured in a as it's essentially real time continuous. Um, although the definition of continuous it still hasn't been really refined as to what that means. There's a lot of different sub definitions around that, and you have to do um, I believe three of the um, elective uh, sets, any any three. So those are the conditions, and then um, so looking at the uh, the timeline that's going on there. So the final guideline docu base document was released in December. The registration just opened in January, January eighth. Um, the final guideline. Uh, Appendix A, which was absolutely critical uh, to the entire understanding, was not released in December. It was actually only released um, a couple of weeks ago or a week and a half ago or so. Um, so Appendix A explains, for example, what, uh, what's, what, what is meant by stroke and how to measure that, as opposed to the consumer side of it, um, as well as uh, pretty much every other condition. Basically presents the criterion standards and some hints of the environments that the testing will occur. And so the hint there is that not all the conditions are tested strictly by the consumers by themselves. Stroke is one of these things that you really don't want to be running a competition by yourself. It's actually done in a clinical setting, but it has a lot of the usability aspects that uh, Tricorder uh, generally does as well. Um, so there's a there's a, a registration, there's a set of registration deadlines, so uh, 5K, 10K, actually it's 25K, <coughs> not 15, that's a typo. Um, to register, so April 10th is a, is a big date because it uh, becomes more expensive to register for to register a team after that, after 10K, and then and then the registration closes at the end of August. Um, there's a qualifying round, basically, <coughs> excuse me, about a year um, a year from now, um, and then the uh, the final round starts uh, at the end of the year in in, uh, in 2014, and then the final competition is uh, in June uh, 2015, or the final awards. 
Um, so basically that timeline more or less hasn't, hasn't moved from the original guidelines, even though some of the guidelines took another three, four or five months to get released from expectation. Um, so in terms of the team, so that's just kind of an overview and the update of what was going on. In terms of the team, uh, it, it's definitely a challenge to enter into something like this. It's definitely a challenge in Canada. I mean, there's, there's uh, besides the technical issues, which let's ignore those for now, even though they are actually very substantial, um, funding and, and focus are kind of the issues. So unfortunately in Canada, it's unreliable to be able to get funding for something like this. You need a, a wealthy patron, pretty much. Um, it's not a venture on its own, and it's not really an academic exercise by itself. It's somewhere in the middle between those two. So there isn't really a, a standard process of funding something like that. Or crowdfunding. Uh, which? Crowdfunding. Um, you could uh, possibly do it. The trouble with it is that every team, well, okay, so for example, first of all, Kickstarter doesn't allow you to do health devices, so you can't go on Kickstarter. You can go with something like Indiegogo or any of the other thousand or so. Um, it would have to be uh, something Canada special. You'd have to have some kind of a, a deliverable kind of along those lines. Um, this is this is going to take real money to do and, and real effort to do. It's, it's several million dollars. Um, that's not that's not yet an established process. Even crowdfunding is not an established process to raise, let's say, seven million dollars that you might need to get this done. Well, I was just thinking of registration to start off. Um, you can register with that, but but I, I think you're you're going to get people excited about something deliverable as opposed to just registering. So the, the issue is not raising money to register. Uh, 25k is not a lot of money. The issue is actually uh, putting together a team that, that has some some chance of actually getting closer to that. So. Um, uh, to be blunt, I, I haven't found the uh, the wealthy patron that's necessary. Um, the other side of it is there's a it's a contest, it's a competition versus a marketable product. Um, the intent here is to actually launch companies and, and launch products into markets that, that will be viable. Um, and there is actually a, a conflict between those. Uh, uh, the tricorder as defined, uh, the tricorder as a concept, I think, is a very remarkable product. The tricorder competition as defined is something else. It's a competition, it's a game show um, with really phenomenal sort of goals and, and, and drive, but it's, it is a little bit of a game show. And so there's a, there's a strong conflict between those two, uh, actually making a market product in that. So there's definitely challenges in entering that. <coughs> there's alternatives, um, uh, alternatives to participating as an independent team. One is join forces with another team. Um, and in fact, uh, XPRIZE uh, formally recognized this approach. They have a facility where you can actually network and, and get together with other teams as well. So, uh, so we haven't made a complete decision whether we're going to enter or not. Um, that decision is coming up very, very rapidly. So uh, April 10th is a, is, a, is a major milestone there. Um, but the one, th I think, really important part about it is that regardless of whether we enter or not, um, it's already served as an absolutely phenomenal catalyst to get a, um, a quite a number of uh, people together in, in different very different domains, and in fact, we, we actually uh, launched a company which uh, includes a subset. Pretty much everybody who is uh, sort of core team of the company right now um, was on a Tricor XPRIZE uh, team competition. So that's Aterica. Uh, I'm not going to do too much about Aterica, just to give you a little introduction. Uh, basically, our focus is on digital health, uh, and that's there's different definitions around that, but basically we focus on enabling individuals to actively manage their health. So it's focusing on individuals uh, and bringing sophisticated tools to individuals. That's the key part. Um, a pedometer is a good start, but it's not a very sophisticated tool, just to, to put it into context. So our initial product actually is not even measuring the individual, it's measuring the environment. It's a personal food allergen detector. I won't go too much uh, further into that one, but that's, uh, that's an interesting, uh, that's, our, that's our initial focus. Uh, and so as I mentioned, the core team <coughs> is basically a subset. I really shouldn't be coughing into that. Um, is a subset of the um, uh, the Tricor XPRIZE team that had, uh, there was, we met a number of our members here through uh, different facilities of this forum in general. And then our stages, we're, ex we're actively raising venture funding and uh, improving technology concepts right now. So if anybody's interested in that, I can, I can talk about it later, but just a quick thing. I guess the key part is that the, um, again, regardless of whether we enter or not, it absolutely catalyzed uh, people concepts, teams, thinking, um, to, to launch at least one company, perhaps perhaps more. Okay, so that's uh, that's topic number two. The um, number three is um, there's a, um, we, we really, okay, so kind of a side tangent, we really need to change this, this following comment 
this got started in California. So there was a health technology forum that got started in Silicon Valley, and just like Quantify itself, that is uh, building momentum um, and getting people together to talk about health technology. And it's not just digital health, it's actually all, all health technology overall. Uh, and bringing together sort of all the, um, uh, all the stakeholders in that in my environment for informative and educational presentations, networking, and action, and you know, actually getting stuff done. Um, so we're, uh, we're starting um, the Toronto uh, chapter of the Health Technology Forum. Uh, the first event, uh, kickoff event, is on April 8th. It's going to be in the old uh, space that Quantify itself has been doing at the uh, ING Orange, uh, uh, Network Orange. It's mostly Agent Orange. Um, <clears throat> and so um, we actually had uh, way more interest right off the bat than I had expected. So it's almost sold out in the sense that we can only fit 40 people in there, and I think there was 37 last night. Um, there's a waiting list, so uh, so sign up. We're going to have events in different areas, probably. It's called Health Technology Forum for Branding, but really it's an Ontario chapter is the way I usually I think about it. We're going to have a bunch in Toronto. We're going to try to do some in uh, Kitchener-Waterloo. We're going to try to do some in Hamilton, maybe even as far as London, if you can get to that area. This this little cluster has a lot of health, uh, health technology activity going on in this 200-kilometer area. So um, there's some links there. I'm sure we'll get the links posted up as well. Um, and there's also actually an event that's happening in California um, at the end of April, which is the first conference of the Health Technology Forum. Okay, and then uh, obligatory, uh, obligatory quantified itself. So, um, <clears throat> so I'm not a diabetic. Um, the reason I confirm with myself as well, um, but it's uh, it's kind of interesting. I wanted to see, I wanted to take a look at the usability of measuring biomarkers in the consumer, and basically. Um, glucose monitoring is the state of the art of individual sort of tools for very sophisticated, uh, fair about. It's not a very sophisticated biomarker, but it's the most sophisticated we sort of have in the consumer space right now. So I wanted to see how that works. So um, I'm measuring my fasting um, blood glucose level. And fasting basically, <coughs> try a different direction. Uh, fasting basically means um, First thing in the morning, when I get up, that's the first thing that I do. If nothing else happens, the first thing that I do is I, I test my blood glucose. Why it's the most, um, I, I don't have access to uh, a continuous blood glucose monitor. That would be fantastic. If somebody wants to outfit me and, and wants to, vote, I'll, I'll volunteer to, to wear that and, and use that continuously. Um, so the trouble is you have to sample your blood. Um, your blood glucose varies drastically throughout the day um, through different levels. Fasting is the most stable metabolic state that you kind of have. Um, trying to reduce the noise, basically, is the, is the kind of the idea. So fasting blood glucose is what I monitor. Um, how do I do it? So I evaluated a whole lot of um, different uh, glucometers and picked one that, I'm not gonna advertise it too much, but it's this one, that is the most usable. Um, I don't have to deal with sharps. I don't have to deal, deal with uh, needles or lance. Uh, Lancets. Uh, I don't have to deal with sort of the the, the bloody. Um, is that way that? Uh, I don't have to deal with the uh, the bloody strips. It's all kind of captured inside there. Um, the really interesting part about it is that there is uh, there's a lot of devices out there. They cost about the same, which device basically is free, and the uh, the strips is what costs uh, a lot. Um, the usability though is all over the board. Like it's. Some of them are just, you, you don't understand how people are expected to be using this, but this one's really good. So I picked this one in particular, I looked at a whole bunch of different ones. Um, so um, committed to doing $1 per measurement, which is basically the cost. And so I'm doing it once a day, that's not too bad, but consider uh, a type 1 diabetic who's doing 15 times a day. Um, and basically I test uh, blood glucose every morning, um, first thing when, you, when getting up. So I don't have uh, strong data. Really, I'm, I'm really at the point of establishing a little bit of a baseline so I can have uh, strong data. Sorry. Just quickly, what is the device? Um, Are you allowed to say it? It's, uh, well, I'm allowed to say okay, um, I don't know if it. Was like a I can check mobile by Roche. Um, <clears throat> there, uh, there were five bucks just to get a device um, at Walmart um, because you pay 100 bucks for 100 strips. Um, well, they're not strips, they're cartridges actually. It's actually a very different design from, from most other uh, glucometers. Um, so I'm, I'm really just establishing a little bit of a baseline to understand how it varies and try to do sort of a soft correlation. I do want to, um, I definitely want to get to a point where I can correlate against activities and, and other sort of behaviors. 
So I don't have uh, very quantified data around that, but there's there's patterns you should start start to see. One one pattern is um, it's very variable, and I think you know anybody who studies this knows this, but it's interesting to learn that on yourself. It, it varies by time of um, uh, type of meal and, and uh, the meals that you had previous days, by the amount of physical exercise, and this is hard for me to figure out, but it looks like it might be a 24 to 48 hour delay relative to exercise. Actually, my blood glucose baseline seems to increase a couple of days after exercise. Um, the amount of quality of sleep for sure, uh, general, general state of health versus a cold or not, that absolutely seems to have an impact, and actually genetics as well. So there's some interesting stuff there that uh, my baseline is different from other uh, groups within that, and actually I, I fit strongly into my group, uh, 23 Me. <clears throat> has a measurement around this. Um, so you have the, the 23andMe data to inform the... 23 me uh, is doing surveys around what your normal blood glucose is, and actually it turns out that mine is pretty much exactly in the range for my Apple group, which is which I thought was interesting. Um, so uh, there's several item, uh, other items there, but I think we're running out of time. So that's kind of the idea. So I'd actually encourage everybody to do it. It's, like, it's, not, it's really not a big deal. It's, it's expensive. That's one thing. If you don't have a prescription, you gotta pay for it yourself. But in terms of difficulty of doing this, it's not difficult. It's easy to do every morning. It takes me, the basic process with this device takes me about 15 seconds maximum, sometimes 10. So is it technologically feasible to do blood glucose monitoring without a reusable strip? So um, it's commercially, that's yeah, it's a, good question. a razor blade model, right? Yep. So the question is, can it be done? Without that model. There, there's a lot of, I mean, that's a many billion dollar question. Um, yeah. There's a lot of people trying. There's some optical techniques. There's a company in Israel that seems to finally have something that might be working. Uh, people have tried like the optical um, reusable techniques for a long time, and, and they all have kind of failed. There's actually a great book that talks about every way that uh, low invasive blood glucose has failed. Um, <clears throat> I, I think it is possible, and I think we're, we're going to get to that point, but there is a strong uh, commercial momentum on that. It's, uh, the business model for this is absolutely phenomenal. You're printing money for this, literally actually printing money. Um, so uh, about any, any topics at all, I'm, I think we're running out of time, but uh, comments, questions? When are you done so you can rent it and others can do it? Uh, when am I done with this? Yeah. Uh, this is easy. Uh, this is easy to pick up. Like I said, they're five bucks. I, I have I bought a bunch of them because I'm an engineer. I'm going to take some of them apart. In fact, I've taken most of them apart. Um, this one hasn't has never been used. If anybody wants to buy it, by all means, I have my own. It's actually pretty important. You, um, particularly for the Lansing device, you don't want to be using somebody uh, somebody else's. That should be private. That, that should be individual. Um, I have, you know, quite unusable, <laughs> as far as I'm concerned. If you don't have a choice, and that's what you depend on survive, absolutely, to survive, absolutely, you're going to use whatever you, you got. But, but this is way more usable than every other one, including the Bayer ones. Um, there's, I forgot the exact name, but there's uh, sort of this one that looks like a medallion. I don't remember the exact name. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. But this, well, I mean, one, one of the acts of actually taking out the strip, like, you, you don't see a lot of people, um, just to kind of demonstrate the usability aspect of it, you don't see a lot of people testing blood uh, throughout the day because you kind of do this on the side where nobody sees you. And there's there's so much involved in most of these devices. You have to take this strip out, you have to put it in. Um, the older stuff had even more stuff. You have to take the lancet out. You have to insert the lancet. Maybe it's already there, maybe it's not. Then you have to dispose of all of the results. You do the measurement, you, you dispose of the results. It's way too much work. This one has actually done it really well. Yeah. These are the guys you should be following. <laughs> you, you. Well, I think that's why they're uh, they're actually innovating, uh, because they're behind, relatively speaking, to everybody else. So they need to actually bring a product that that is somehow better, um, and they're definitely innovating. Um, in fact, most of my top ones that I've looked at actually were from Roche. Uh, I have no connection to Roche, so I, like I didn't even mention the name. Um, but I think they're actually innovating. Um, the trouble is there's momentum, I think, that's going on. Um, well, A, you've got a, a captive audience, and B, there's momentum that's going on. So there's really not a lot of impetus to innovate um, on things like usability and so on. 
Um, my motivation is a little bit different. My, I'm not diabetic. My motivation is quantification. Um, but I think there's a, these two worlds are going to collide at some point in time. I think usability is absolutely essential for uh, bringing these kinds of devices to consumers. My apologies, but this killed everybody in terms of usability. Like, there's absolutely no competition <laughs> from usability point of view. Accuracy, all those things, we can we can definitely argue about. But usability, this was absolutely the best. And and yet, you can do better. Very, very briefly, the Lansing device has a cartridge. It's built inside. It has uh, six uh, six lancets. You never see the needle. It's it's very easy. It has a physical attachment, so you never lose it. Except, except right now, um, I've never actually removed it. Somehow you have to attach it there. Um, anyways, normally it's physically attached, so you don't lose it. Uh, it uses cartridges or cassettes actually, and the cassette it's actually tape that uh, brings a new one and brings the bloody stuff back, back in. So you're never actually dealing with the blood or throwing it out at all. And there's 50, 50 tests here, and there's six lancets in here. And lancets, you can reuse. It's, it's, not, it's not that big of a deal. If you have a good immune system, which most of us do, um, it's not that big of a deal. Any other questions? We have uh, time for just one last uh show and tell and uh, so thank you Alex.